Отлично, хорошо, да. Значит, друзья, я okay. хочу представить нашего okay. гостя. У нас в рамках выставки «Еловые окрестности», которая проходит сейчас в Екатеринбургском музее изобразительных искусств на Воеводина 5 в гостях, ну, в виртуальных гостях Марк Дива, художник и куратор из Швейцарии с которым нас связывает довольно продолжительная история. 25 лет назад Марк курировал легендарный фестиваль «Ебракон» — экологический арт-мост, который прошел как раз в Екатеринбурге при участии европейских и уральских сибирских художников. Этот сюжет занимает особое место в экспозиции выставки «Еловой окрестности» и является очень важным отправным таким сюжетом для многих тенденций и трендов, которые сейчас в уральском искусстве существуют. И в частности, один из этих трендов связан с формой такого коллективного, коллаборативного способа творчества. Сегодня мы пригласили Марка, чтобы он рассказал нам о своей практике, о своих художественных проектах, которыми он занимается в данный текущий момент, и самое важное о том, как вообще устроена форма коллективного труда, зачем она нужна, творческого труда и для чего вообще нам нужен и необходим коллектив в, в контексте художественной жизни. Вот. Если у нас все трансляции запущены, все гости, кто хотел к нам присоединиться с нами, я передаю слово Марку и хочу еще поприветствовать Марию Самсонову, нашу переводчицу, она будет нам помогать помогать сегодня а, в беседе с Марком. И вот если а, Мария уже упомянула, если вы хотите а. выбрать русскую дорожку с переводом внизу, вы можете значок планеты нажать и выбрать русский трек, либо а, слушать английский оригинальный рассказ Марка. Все, передаю слово Марку на этом и приветствую вас всех, и Марк в том числе. А, все. So, uh, hello, 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 uh, dear spectators, dear art lovers, dear students, dear everybody uh, on the internet. Um, so, my name is Mark Devo. <clears throat> As said, I'm an artist and also a creator. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about my artistic and also curatorial practices. And I'll underline this with a little bit of theory and lots of fun examples from my wild life and uh, all my experiences. During this lecture, we will take a short tour through my, um, through my um, current uh, apartment. Um, I am famous for doing something which I call the inhabited sculpture. And it's also a kind of a collective work And this means that I'm uh, basically advocating for a novelty type of museum where the center is around the artist and the artist who actually has to also be alive for this lives in this space. And uh, with the help of this, you can actually truly understand art and um, artistic practices. Now, why would you want to do this in the first place? Because, um, isn't art something rather boring and for like older people? Um, yes, indeed it is so. And, um, but art is also, as we have known now that, um, uh, for example, uh, all kinds of systems which we had in the middle ages and in the antique times uh, are not sufficient enough for explaining the context of the world. Uh, art and artists could actually do this. Uh, in a few sentences, because they have the wider picture. And talking about this and talking about also about art and collective art, uh, we must distinguish, I think, uh, between uh, commercial art, 
and the art that's actually uh, being done nowadays by artists. And talking about commercial art, I mean, this is like in the short uh, summary of my lecture, uh, I was talking about the fact that you have like um, a lot of these things, especially in the West, especially in Zurich. And uh, Zurich is a good example for this because Zurich is a very, very uh, rich place. So Zurich is, um, is one of the richest and affluent cities in the world. And I would say like, so 25 years, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, art was of absolutely no interest in Zurich. And the artists were actually considered to be a little bit of a nuisance. And uh, the, the faster they would go to the madhouse or maybe even the best thing would be to leave the country, um, the better for society. Uh, that's what Steve is doing because of course the artist does not work, an artist does not really produce anything. And uh, this of course is a total negation of uh, this um, capitalist society, which is of course predominant in Zurich where, uh, yeah, can you put the coffee on there? Um, where, yeah, uh, where the, where all is about money and counting money and everything has to be super productive. So what is this guy doing, wasting his time, making all these like uh, stupid drawings in his attic or, or maybe an oil painting or a sculpture, which nobody wants to have anyway. And um, how can it be, you know, that somebody is not, uh, uh, in the factory at uh, seven o'clock in the morning or behind the counter of some nice bank at eight o'clock, of course, because it's not so harsh if you work in administrative uh, jobs in Switzerland. So anyway, now uh, to get to the point. So as said, in Switzerland, this was seen as something that is very uh, despicable and we wouldn't want to touch this. Uh, and Switzerland has, has, has a long and complicated um, history with artists and art. But there is actually one institution, one art movement, which started off in Zurich. And uh, very strangely enough, uh, it has to be Dadaism. Now, how strange is that? Like uh, uptight Swiss, uh, making wild parties, jumping around naked, um, uh, doing uh, declining uh, senseless um, 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 poems, um, somehow it doesn't fit. Well, of course it doesn't fit because all the artists who were involved in, in Dadaism, guess what? Not a single one of them was Swiss. They were all either Germans, Romanians. I think there even was a few Russians if we count Lenin into the bunch because he actually lived next door. So it's very, very possible that he did some singing there after a few glasses of beer with his friends, of course. Now, um, and Dadaism started in, in Zurich. And Zurich always had a very problematic relationship with this uh, art movement. So, uh, of course, uh, one didn't really take this serious. Uh, after a long, long time, sometime in the 60s, uh, uh, they decided to put a plaque on the house where this movement started. What's also interesting to know about this movement, that this movement only rented uh, the place where they made the so-called Cabaret Voltaire, which I assume everybody knows. Um, and this was not a, um, this is not a place that belonged to anybody. This was just a place where artists were tolerated. So they were allowed to make their noisy, horrible, disgusting performances there to annoy everybody and, um, one was happy that it, when it was over, and in fact, actually, uh, the original Dadaists got kicked out after, I think, something like uh, two months or two and a half months. It was over, and the landlord had enough of all this noise, and also the neighbors, and they threw them out. And um, as said, a long time, the city of Zurich um, ignored um, the fact that this even happened in Zurich, or took it more as an embarrassment than a compliment and certainly nothing uh, to talk about uh, on a big stage. Um, and in the 60s, as I said, uh, they placed a plaque. Uh, the place where this happened uh, mutated a few times. There was a disco there, there was a few restaurants there. In the end, it got shut down 
and actually all the neighbors who um, were living around this place in Zurich were very happy that uh, this place uh, was closed because it was a constant um, um, a constant uh, um, spring well of uh, noise and where drunk people were running around so they didn't want this. Uh, this is also again an after effect of gentrification. Back in the days when uh, the Dadaists and uh, our friend Lenin lived in uh, Zurich, uh, this was a very bad area. In fact, this was a very bad area right until the 80s. It was uh, full of nightclubs and prostitutes. But um, then something happened, and this happened in the 90s, which is generally known as gentrification. Uh, all these people left, and nowadays there are no more nightclubs. Uh, they are just like nice shops. And... Um, some tourists and at night it's all quiet because all the rich people who have bought these beautiful houses there because they are very beautiful uh, they have it nice and quiet and can enjoy the feeling of being in the old town of Zurich. So the Cabri Voltaire was uh, abandoned for a long time and um, not for a long time actually it was only for a few months and uh, I reopened this place by um, by squatting it with a group of uh, artists and there we did something which we called which you will also see here which is generally known as the inhabited sculpture this means this is something that's open all the time 24 hours and you could come and view artistic practices and depending on the size of the sculpture it can also include a bar a disco a casino a strip club a swinger club whatever you want and also maybe something for sport or a dancing and yeah. But it's generally just a place of amusement where we encourage people to do whatever they want. And maybe if they want and if they have the ability to, and I do believe that everybody has the ability to do so, to make art and indulge and enjoy art. And this in fact is the main thing which we encourage with people. People like to come to our spaces and people feel transformed somewhere else. Very often this uh, notion can be achieved very easily if you show them something that they already know. So what do they know? They know maybe, they know the asset. Well, in Russia, who, what they know about art? They know the Hermitage. Everybody's seen the Hermitage. Everybody knows. It's very nice, um, very nice, uh, what do you call it, wallpaper in the Hermitage. And they also have nice big windows. And they also have like old furniture there. And then there's also some paintings and the artworks. And uh, this uh, thing of Hermitage, this phenomenon, it works actually in every country. And uh, if you show it in the Czech Republic, they will say it's a Prague castle. And if you will show it in Zurich, they would, would, would think, oh, it's the, uh, it's the historical museum, which we have and which everybody knows. And everybody was forced to go there and to have a look at it as a child. So it's something that is indeed familiar and associates with art. So we bring the people to this environment and suddenly people who have nothing to do with each other, never met each other, suddenly loosen up and become like very much, um, so they let go of themselves, you know, of their, of their indeed, I would say, like sort of um, uh, profane existences and um, uh, egoistic goals, which they might have in their life. And they open up and they become aware of art and things and the things are maybe not how they are or how they perceive them the things can also be quite 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 different and through doing this um we are actually using and this is that special secret magic power that art has is we can put people uh in in a um position where we can actually uh, communicate to them and we leave a lasting impression. People never ever forget when they have been to these spaces. It's something that's ingrained in their brains. I don't know why this is like that. Maybe it's because not too much is going on in their lives otherwise, but as said, but in any case, this is the special power of art. You can actually move things with art. And in my eyes, and especially in this day and age, and except for the uh, philosophical aspect, which I, the philosophical, it's not only philosophical, it's also social and it's also deeply political um, aspect. Um, 
of course, this is the one of the like main aspects of art in my eyes. It's just to bring together people who don't belong together. This is like to abridge, um, say, gorges or like valleys. Maybe it's better, uh, like to abridge um, these differences that we have as uh, humans and positions. So we can bring um, a homeless and a banker and maybe even a policeman, um, a soldier, a housewife, and a hippie, and a band of uh, punk musicians together. And with the help of art, they will all get on really, really well, and they won't fight, and they will be peaceful human beings, peaceful individuals. And this is something that, of course, we strive for, because by being like this, being open, peaceful, and nice, we achieve a better society and we are ourselves much better and we manage to live much, much happier like this. And this is very important if you uh, know about um, the history of the, of the human beings, you know that um, humans are prone to conflict quite often and this is something one should avoid. Why am I talking about all of this rubbish? Why does anyone want to know it? Well, I'm talking about it because in the context nowadays, and especially in Zurich, and Zurich is, as I said, a very, very good um, example because you can see the vast developments of the last 25 years in a kind of micro, in a very extreme microcosmos. Of course, it's like quite the opposite of what, not the opposite, but it's quite different from what has happened in, um, all these uh, post-Soviet countries, including Russia. Um, but it is still a similar phenomenon with that we can see. And it's actually more extreme because, as I said, like in uh, within capitalist society, um, art in itself was shunned and seen as something uh, very disrespectable and something you would rather not engage with and for sure not want to see, for example, your children or your relatives or your parents engage with, um, than maybe, for example, in the Soviet Union where uh, artists were put on some kind of pedestal also. So we had none of this, but then it changed suddenly. Now, um, uh, um, I need, um, so it suddenly it changed. Now it changed in the, this change happened uh, in the in, in, in the nineties, in the middle of the nineties, in the late nineties. Um, all this art boom started. Started, of course, in America, and actually started earlier. But because Switzerland is a little bit of uh, you know they are not the most advanced people, they uh, like to see what's going on. And when it's very very hundred percent sure everything's going to work out, the Swiss might jump the boat. So I think they might have even joined uh, the, the, in, in the Second World War, but they might have done that in 1946, when it was clear who was the winner, and then Switzerland would, of course, join the winning side. But as they lent everybody money, um, and uh, in the end took also a lot of money, they, of course, were on the winning side from the beginning onward, but nobody knew about that because they never joined sides. So, but anyway, so in Switzerland, also this whole... Um, the money and the uh, possibility of making um, something out of nothing um, doomed on um, also people who had uh, a lot of money, very wealthy, very powerful people. And one of these people who probably nowadays everybody, anybody who is familiar with the art world will know the name of Hauser and Wirth. And it's um, Ivan Hauser and Manuela Wirth. Hi, both of you, if you see me. Um, who I also like briefly know, I don't really know them, but I, I mean, I know them from dinner parties, but I know them when they were not uh, this top notch gallery, which they are nowadays with, uh, I don't know, they have uh, little shops everywhere all over the world. And they are like uh, one of the number one uh, gallerists. Well, back in the days, they weren't gallerists, but they were what they are nowadays. They were very wealthy though. So they, uh, inherited uh, an empire of uh, shops selling household devices like washing machines, toasters and uh, electric toothbrushes and they got fabulously wealthy with this. 
I think it was actually their parents and grandparents. And um, as we know, it's not very glamorous to sell a toothbrush, nor is it really uh, seen as uh, en vogue to be selling a washing machine. Now, what to do with, uh, with this problem? Like back in the days, uh, it was more simple. Uh, these people uh, opened up a fashion store or a chain of uh, shoe shop, a really fashionable shoe shop. But nowadays, of course, we're more advanced and there's really wild parties in New York and in Basel going on. And of course, you all want to join that. You want to have fun. And at the same time, you can even make money with this. Well, how cool is that? So let's do that. And these people came in with a lot of money and suddenly art became something that might also interest people from Zurich. Why is that? Of course, because they saw like all the money going around. And they saw people, uh, I don't know, maybe some artists just make a, take a white canvas, make a poo on it and sell it for a lot of money. I'm not actually talking about Andy Warhol who pissed on a, on a sink a plate, but still it's a very good example about this. Now, um, Andy, good old uh, phony Andy Warhol pissing on the sink plate is a very interesting phenomenon because when back in the days when he did this, um, Everybody said, wow, that's such a stupid idea. It's quite crazy. Who is crazy enough to buy this? But lo and behold, he sold, of course, all of his zinc plates. And I think they went for a few thousand dollars. Everybody thought anyone who's buying this is crazy. But of course, they're not crazy because they, in the end, they made a good investment. Because nowadays, these zinc plates are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but this just shows us the absurdity of uh, commercial art. Because what was the um, what was the social impact of pissing on the on on the zinc plate? It's kind of quite zero, because it's um, yeah. So, but um, yeah. So anyway, in Zurich, at the same time, you had um, a lot of this commercialism coming in. Before that, you had a lot of like artists and art squads and a lot of uh, illegal um, small bars, initiatives, everything I said on the border of legality. Nobody of these um, people ever had a license for selling alcohol or doing a party because uh, Zurich was, as said, back in the 80s, back in the 90s, now I'm skipping time, was very, very conservative and uh, essentially Protestant place where not much was happening. But there was a very large art life. And when these big galleries came in, they basically profited of these seeds which were sown in the 80s and the 90s. The seeds which were sown by people who were not at all interested in any having uh, acquiring money or becoming rich, but just like artists and people enjoying themselves and trying to push the borders of society, because of course art is always, I mean, relevant art is always about pushing a border. So if you, and the border can, it can be anywhere, you know, like back in the days when we had, um, when um, Picasso came in, um, we, uh, it, it was revolutionary to draw just a picture with a few lines. Nowadays, uh, this is not so interesting anymore. Also, we can't make a black square because it's all been done before. So we should try to do something else and try to push the border. Now, where could this border be nowadays? And as I said, we all know that um, commercialization of art is nothing that is uh, in any way um, beneficial for society or for anybody. The only person who actually really benefits from it is um, the guy in the tax office because um, and uh, also the tax advisor and the advisor who advises the rich person to buy the art. The rest of the people are kind of fucked because the artist will only re receive a fragment of what uh, the artwork is worth and at the same time people are buying the artwork um, indirectly they are speculating with the artist's death. And this would hopefully happen as fast as possible after the purchase, because then the artwork might increase in work, in, 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 in value, sorry, in value, and um, 
everybody would have something from that, especially the bank and uh, and especially the persons who are uh, owning these uh, lovely art pieces because they can use these art pieces as um, counterbalance a loan, for example, if they want to buy, for example, a nice villa in Saint-Tropez. So what I'm trying to show is the absurdity of all of these things that are happening. And as said, Maybe you guys know Art Basel or Art Miami. Maybe you've even been there. I've been there a few times. I must say these are very um, boring places where you can see a lot of repetitive things. But um, in the normal world, this is deemed as something where you can actually see art. Well, I think not really, I would say. You can't really experience it there. And the reason is because it's all loaded with money and power and um, this is in the end effect uh, artists should not um, be too close to these um, these two things I mean it's not I'm not saying that the artists shouldn't have any money because I do think artists should have money and artists should be given a lot more uh, resources than they actually get at the moment and but these resources should be in, in a like uh, I mean it should be commodities like space for example of course you also need money but what's much more important is space and space and also of course an attention span and there I think um, that in the um, in, in in regions like where there used to be like industry which was very very um, big there and where this industry has declined it's very interesting to give um, artists the spaces which are now freed because they can do something there but it's very important to give it only to the artist and so there, there is no um, that and also to artist collectives so artists who kind of know how to run something and then to let them do whatever they want basically um because this would lead to a very interesting situation and also it would be very important of course that all of these uh, places are heated decently and artists have enough materials to work and have for whatever they need for their artistic performances and also of course that there is um, enough food and enough to drink for them and their guests now if we would do this which would not be too much it costs much less than uh and a small battalion of soldiers do this in, uh, in say, a, a city like Katrinburg, we would uh, end up with quite uh, astonishing results. And, um, but anyway, as said, this is um, just a theory. And now I will um, slowly come to the second part of my lecture, where we will, uh, first of all, have a look at um, my notion of the... Um, collective sculpture and we will have a look at uh, various artworks and afterwards we will look at uh, my latest uh, collective production with my friend Pavel where we are trying to use like um, to fuse um, latest technology with um, the oldest ideas with very simple and um, easy ideas so okay so we'll go on a small tour mm. so here my tour starts so this is basically the entrance of my inhabited sculpture i will just turn the computer around i hope you can all hear me nicely i hope it's not too fast probably it was too fast so this is the entrance and here we have uh, the salon the salon of my apartment here is where we have uh, lots of events are happening here i hope you can all see it it's like um wow it looks like in the hermitage it has also beautiful wallpaper and can you see up here what do we have here we have a chandelier it's like in the hermitage and there's even some pictures with the golden frames here you can see my art collection um these are like some of the things i produced myself and again, I'm working with um, 
found material and trash. These are my sponge pictures. I do a lot of them. It's basically a pun on concrete art. I don't know if you know concrete art. Concrete art is something like the only art movement which um, Zurich actually acknowledges as being from Zurich. And the uh, most famous uh, of these artists is called Max Bill. And what did he do? He put little squares next to each other. Uh, you might say, oh, this sounds like Mondrian. Well, yes, it is like Mondrian. But the difference is that Mondrian did this in 1920 and Max Bill started to do this in the 1940s when it was already clear that this something like this might go. But because as we already saw with the uh, uh, reception of the, um, of the uh, Cabaret Voltaire, that um, Switzerland is not the most pro progressive place when it comes to artistic uh, means and people could be fooled quite fastly in the 40s to think that this is something very avant-garde, although it was at least 20 years old. So, yeah, but away from this, here you could see my beautiful porcelain collection. I have a lot of porcelain. It's like also in the Hermitage, you will find lots of porcelain. There is busts of uh, famous people and even a bronze sculpture. It's very similar to the Hermitage. And um, so now here, is as we've been here before we have my the hall and here now we enter my studio and I as I said before uh, I do something like I am famous for doing something like the inhabited sculpture and the inhabited sculpture um, means that I also I work and I live in the same space and I make events and um, yeah and so here we have um, I will, I'm, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you uh, the latest production that I am involved in. I always think that's very interesting. Mm. And um, this is a collective work, which I did together with my uh, Russian friend, uh, Pavel Emilianov. And um, we're gonna see this latest installation. As said, um, I, I work a lot with um, with new technologies, I would call it, and computers. So we have done something here, which is um, based on uh, Arduino. And it is a little um, machine. It's like, um, I would say it's a kind of a perpetuum mobile. And um, let's have a look at it. So now it's starting. So this is our machine here. Can we hold it like that? Do we, do we see it correctly? Yes. Okay. So what is this machine doing? It looks like really, really senseless. So you can see, and you can see up here. So here we have water dripping in here. What we have here in the two glasses are sensors attached. And they generate, uh, they produce sound. So there is a sound coming from these generators. The higher the volume of the water, the higher the pitch of the um, sound, whereas it's the other way around. It's actually the other way around with that one. And here we have, um, now these things can interact with these, um, with, with, these are like light sensors. And uh, when you're in the, you're in the picture now, and the shadow. And it's all also about the shadow. So what we will do at the end, this, art, this artwork, can be enormous. Because what you actually see are the shadow, is the shadow of the, uh, of the object, the background, you see it there. And normally we project this, uh, this, this image. And let's go closer and we will see like what we have here. So here we have uh, here we have uh, these um, like the the light se laser sensors interrupters which um, react. So if you take your hand away again, then you can see. And as you can see here, the water starts to overflow and it changes thing. This is a weird little thing which can be put up. And I'm sorry that um, 
it's kind of not dark enough here now at the moment. But as you can see, it's something that is quite fascinating. And people ask themselves when they see it, what is this? And what is it for? And all we can actually say is, well, it's really, it's totally for nothing. It has no use at all. Um, and so that, what could it be? It could be art. And even there is like no nice wallpaper here. So it's like, yeah. But yes. And I don't know, like, so maybe um, now I would like to, because I'm, because uh, uh, I'm like, the importance of, uh, <coughs> of collective art. Can you turn this off quickly? Um, the, the importance of collective art and what this has to do and why is this lecture, why am I lecturing about this? So first of all, um, one of the most important things I think for me is to work with people. And I always work with people. I've never ever done anything on my own because uh, I'm an artist and artists are, of course, everybody knows arts are very lazy. They sleep like until uh, 12 o'clock and they don't work and they don't want to stand up and that's why they're artists. Otherwise they wouldn't be artists. So I also, I am like totally like this. I fit this cliche and um, that's why I like to work with people because then I don't need to do anything and the people can do work for me and do something for me. And this is actually very, I mean, this is, I'm saying this in like a negative way, but it's actually very positive because, because um, I am not flaunting my ego. Like it's actually usual, like we saw like how Andy Warhol did it with a peeing on the thing plate. And as said, here we have various, um, various installations, which are kind of similar. Now, I don't know if you can see this one. I think maybe there's kind of not enough light, but here, we have a um, very interesting sculpture. I think you can actually see it. Yes, you can see it. And what does it look like? It looks like a, a movie, like a film. It looks kind of quite advanced, but it actually is totally not advanced, unadvanced. Um, it is, um, it's actually, all it is, is a plastic bottle and some light. And here you can see what it is. There is just a pet bottle here. It's like the most stupid and common thing that you can get and mm. can be found in any trash heap anywhere. And there's like a set of LEDs and we connected this to a little Arduino. You can see it over there. Everybody see the Arduino. And this is, um, so, and this is part of a larger installation, which will consist of, um, many of these uh of these boxes and they will be in different colors and this will be a very uh it's a interesting uh installation at the end of the day yeah so now um why am i doing all this kind of weird computer stuff and what has like collective art got to do with that well as i told you uh or as we all know that um, the commercial art is on the rise. But what is with the artists? Are they still around or did they all join the big gallery? So everybody is like Andy Warhol and, or, or, or Jeff Koons and they're like uh, sitting on a yacht somewhere in the Bahamas or just counting the money and being very rich. Um, like actually we, we should imagine it should be like that because of course we have all those like money spent on art and artists. But of course, uh, that's only the fairy tale and it's not the reality. But as the people still exist and still live, where are they? And I say, well, most, a lot of people are, I would say, hibernating nowadays. What does it mean? It means that uh, the things have moved to somewhere else. And where have they moved to? Well, in the case of the West, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely the, the the case that um, there are many, many festivals and many um, things which are completely cl clandestine and you don't really hear of. One of the interesting ones, which is like more or less known is which you all of course know from TV and from Paris Hilton 
is um, the Burning Man Festival. Uh, Burning Man Festival now also, sadly, sadly, has got a little bit commercialized, so it's not as fun, as interesting as it was maybe uh, 10 years ago, or even 20 years ago. But there are many other events like this happening all around Europe, and most of them people don't even know about. And so I would mention the Fusion Festival, which is a big festival in, uh, which is mainly focused on techno music and on uh, young people taking drugs. But in between all of this uh, craziness, you will also find a lot of artists and a lot of interesting artistic projects. Then there is also the Boom, which is quite famous in, in, in which is in, uh, in Portugal. I will afterwards, I will send you links to these, um, these events. They're basically public, although there is a lottery system where you can join them. And there is, of course, um, a lot of like random projects which spring up here and there all around the world. And uh, what I am doing is, so my, you might ask, what am I doing in all this rubbish here? So why am I not doing uh, something? And well, I am in a way. So I have like uh, events here. I have uh, the room which you just saw, my studio is a place where I show young artists once in a while and all of the time. So I have like art shows here with all kinds of um, uh, artists and I promote again, the get together of people and expose them to the magic of art. And now my next project is actually, I am moving away from the Czech Republic because post-Soviet post -Soviet countries are not so fertile uh, for artists as one might think. So the problem is that there is a lot of uh, dissatisfaction among the general population and this, 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 this dissatisfaction um, the main reason is because like in capitalism, of course, people aren't really equal and some of them have a lot more. And also, uh, it is okay to show this a lot more all the time and everywhere and in your face, which of course creates kind of a bad vibe and a lot of jealousy and is not very beneficial for peaceful coexistence of humans with each other. So I'm moving and I'm now making it starting up a new project. And this project will be in Beja in Alentejo region. So I'm uh, now in the process of um, buying a suitable property to make this kind of uh, center for, I would say, progressive art, cutting edge art. Avant-garde is a very bad term. I would never use this. Um, and social art, which is to happen in Portugal. And in a region which is actually, it's known to be the most backwards and poor region of, uh, of Europe. But at the same time, it's also a very interesting region because space and life are still affordable there which as we have seen is in Zurich, not the case. And in New York also certainly not. And also in Paris, nobody is waiting for the latest artist to show up and to show his pretty paintings. So the idea is to transform and to take this idea of art as a motor for society to a place where there are not too many economic interests. This place could be, I mean, could be the south of Portugal in a European context. Well, it could also be uh, somewhere in Russia, although I think um, that um, maybe the weather isn't good enough. Although there are some nice places also, because it's also very important, like as, um, as a, um, what you say, as a uh, um, confessing uh, hedonist, I, I am, of course, always, uh, I think that the climate is very, very important. 
for an artistic process. And not only the artistic process, process but also for humans living together. So, and that is, at the end of the day, I think that is important and to bring people together is the essence of political art. Now, political art, actually, we in the West, we know a lot of political art from, from Russia. We know a punk band, which is called Pussy Riot. And we know also, we know um, uh, a group called Voina, who paints like penises on the streets. And then a few other like totally crazy dudes. And, um, and uh, funnily enough, they are also part of the uh, commercial process. So that also, you might start to think about that. And what is this? And I, I would say, um, this is also not really interesting. And probably it's also not even political because it's just capitalizing on um, uh, rivaling uh, systems. And for this reason, this is not interesting at all. Because if you are claiming to do something which is um, outside of society, <clears throat> you shouldn't uh, embrace um, this kind of power structures outside your sphere. Yeah, and so again, back to collective art. <clears throat> so, I said, I am always working with, um, with various people and the idea in uh, this new place, which is again being going to call like the old place, which is the Devo Institute. Devo Institute was uh, from 2009 until actually 2021 based in Kolin, not Laban. Uh, that's a small city which is um, outside Prague where I created a art center. It's again the same idea to do something in a place where nobody does something. And this was a very interesting project and we had um, many events there and many festivals, residencies, art exhibitions, and it had uh, quite an impact on the city and now actually many uh, young people got inspired by our actions and it was like mainly also to show people that you can do something with nothing and that's actually the opposite of uh, getting something for nothing that is doing something with nothing and to have uh, something for nothing and not nothing for something because nothing for something is as we saw the uh, basis of uh, commercial art dealing. So what we are doing is we are showing that you can make something even with uh, very limited resources and very uh, small means. This is actually the same thing that we did uh, 25 years ago in uh, Russia, where we just made stuff on the rubbish with rubbish. And we created, well, as we see, because we're in this museum now, um, a lasting impression on the spectators, on the viewers, on the recipient, 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 recipient of uh, our message and the um, uh, audience who saw this show. And this is uh, very empowering for people. So we have society in itself has a benefit from our existence because without this, people wouldn't see the value of things. The most gross example, of course, again, and now again, I return to Zurich, is the Cabaret Voltaire. So the Cabaret Voltaire, which was empty and dormant, and which should have been like, uh, uh, was just about to be uh, sold to Sotheby's. And, and there was no plans of making a museum there. And after we squatted it, and funnily enough, we stayed around about the same time as the original Dadaists in the object, and all money we made, we threw out of the window. So um, this institution or this house was then made into an institution. And nowadays it's an institution. It's actually quite boring and um, meaningless. Um, it's like, uh, and it is uh, perceived by the city of Zurich 
as a marketing tool for tourism. So the same guys who organize like something like the Oktoberfest, I don't know if you know the Oktoberfest. Oktoberfest is like a beer festival where people just get drunk and they drink beer or the carnival where people dress up and drink beer and get drunk. And this is in the same league as um, these events, which is just basically to attract um, tourists to come to Zurich and to spend money in overpriced restaurants, in overpriced bars, and then to go and sleep uh, in an overpriced hotel. Because of course, nobody who is in their right mind would ever do this, except they have a Swiss bank account, of course. But not everybody in the world has a Swiss bank account. So they have to find other people to come there to drink their overpriced beer and eat their overpriced food. And so nowadays, as I said, it is seen as a tourism asset, and I think this is all very, very sad. And we could do without that. And we could use this money, which all these resources which are being consumed in a more sensible way by creating a space where people can experiment and could try to encourage other people, the audience, to be interested in art and of course to make art themselves. Because the moment they make art is the moment when they are also outside the um, capitalist reality, which we all are uh, experiencing. In, in now it's global. Um, so, and that's why I think um, we should have more of these spaces. So. <clears throat> Um, we are coming to the end of our lecture and I would just like to ask um, people, are there any questions? Would people like to ask questions? Or is it everything clear? Or do you uh, accept all this, this strange things and incoherent things that I am talking about? Do you have any questions? Uh, да, Марк, у меня вопрос, если можно. Uh, прежде всего, большое спасибо за uh, рассказ и за тур по вашей скульптуре. Uh, мне вообще очень понравился термин «обитаемая скульптура», и я хотела бы uh, узнать чуть больше, это ваше личное изобретение или uh, есть какие-то прецеденты в истории искусства, такой формы существования художественного произведения. И второй вопрос, связанный тоже с обитаемой скульптурой. Что происходит с этими объектами? Ну, какая у них история? Сколько они живут? Насколько долго существует этот, эта скульптура? Окей, okay, um, so I um, I was looking for something which could describe what I was doing. And people were sort of starting to call it a living sculpture, but I think that's bullshit because there are like loads of living sculptures and it already exists in, in, uh, in, in performative terms. So I started to use the word inhabited sculpture, bewohnte Skulptur in German, because it's actually more, mm, it's more precise. So it's more like saying what I'm doing. Um, about all the objects that I have here, I collect the objects and a lot of them are from the trash. Um, I never throw anything away and I, I, I sometimes I give the things away, but I don't like to do that um, and I keep everything. So a lot of these um, objects have been uh, traveling with me since the last uh, 25 years. And if somebody, normally people who know me for a long time, they come to my flats and I'm somewhere in, I don't know if I'm in New York or if I'm in in Italy or in Denmark or in, uh, in the Czech Republic, they recognize the things. And all these things that you see here, I will uh, take with me, most of them. The rest goes into the trash. So it's also like an interesting thing. 
А, то есть правильно ли я понимаю, что вы приезжаете в какое-то новое пространство, сквотируете его, заполняете, подобно как бы квартире, вот, обставляете вещами, а потом через какое-то время все это забираете и перемещаетесь в другое место? Um, sort of right. It's 50% cigarette. Um, um, I think it's over there. Um, well, it's kind of 50% right because nowadays I buy the place. So I don't squat it. <laughs> and then I fill it with trash, yes. Rubbish, with art and artists and an audience. That's much more important. And then I, then I take all the stuff and I move to the next place. But nowadays, yeah, I, the last project I bought, because I saw like myself squatting places and the value, value of the place increasing a lot after me being there. So I thought maybe I should uh, also be part of this uh, economic process. So I bought the last place. And uh, it's actually been uh, quite profitable for me. And now I can move to a much, much larger space uh, and much nicer space uh, in, in Portugal, thanks to this. So it's also an economic concept. Do you live in these sculptures yourself? Yes, of course, yes. Always. And, and yeah. And there's always a ton of people. And maybe actually this is the, the, the something I missed in my lecture. I should um, introduce you to my cooperator um, who's actually been waiting here um, and who would explain this, the newest sculpture uh, a little bit more clear. I think we should do this. So I'm just gonna hand over the um, the uh, lecture uh, to my friend Pavel, who will introduce himself, and he can explain exactly um, what he has been doing here. Because, as I said, this is a, a collective work, and as I said, that um, also that I am, uh, and that, that I am always interested in uh, getting people to join me. And this time, I have uh, my friend Pavel, and this is Pavel. <laughs> and he can actually talk in Russian and he can explain to what's going on here. Okay. Uh, uh, I give Pavel the word. В общем-то, дело в чем? В наши времена мы совсем перестали думать о том, какие огромные возможности технические находятся всегда рядом с нами. У каждого в кармане находятся устройства с вычислительной мощностью превосходящие все вычислительные мощности госплана СССР. В то же, в то же время а, мы с Марком идем от самых базовых структур и вещей. А, по сути, мы создаем с помощью создаем высокотехнологичные инсталляции из самых э, простых и доступных в наше время э, устройств. А, так, таким образом, э, когда мы перешли в эпоху 64-битных э, э, вычислений, э, мы все еще можем наслаждаться простотой 8-битного процесса э, и находить, э, находить в этом... Э, удовлетворение от работы с самыми простыми вещами, что представляет, представляет нам технологии, а также с мусором, который можно найти повсюду. А, Павел, здравствуйте. Вы меня слышите? А, А теперь я, наверное, могу слышать. У нас колонка платает. А, а Павел, расскажите, пожалуйста, а, про свой бэкграунд. Вы как вообще с Марком стали работать и чем вы раньше занимались? А, я 
Я жил в России, я учился на химическом факультете в МГУ. И переехав сюда, я продолжил образование химическое, но в какой-то момент я разочаровался в науке, в современном состоянии науки. Я, конечно же, очень уважаю научное мышление и подход. И начал искать новые способы применения своих технических, технических навыков и познаний. И в какой-то момент мне довелось встретиться с Марком, который обладает открытым, открытым мышлением и всегда готов к экспериментам. Вот. А вы, то есть вы как бы раньше с искусством не имели никаких а, контактов? Можно сказать, что я имел. Я э, когда-то, когда-то я изучал искусство и э, даже думал, думал стать искусствоведом. Ну и плюс я всегда занимался музыкой и, и другими разными неизобразительными видами искусства. И сейчас оно сошлось вместе, и с Марком мы, у нас продуктивные коллаборации. А, а расскажите, Павел, как вам живется в обитаемой скульптуре Марка Дива? Я так понимаю, вы тоже живете там, в этой инсталляции? А, я здесь не живу, но часто бываю. Это такой мой небольшой дом для философских размышлений. Вот, и для нахождения вдохновления. А на что вообще похожа эта комьюнити, которая вот вас окружает? Это как такая общая мастерская, или это просто как бы, ну, круг друзей, которые по интересам общаются, или это художники, которые реально работают над каким-то проектом вместе, как вы сейчас с Марком? Марк обладает уникальной способностью сплачивать вокруг себя людей и э, создавать комьюнити, то есть налаживать контакты э, всех, э, всех своих э, знакомых. И это дает очень большой э, толчок в, в, произведении, э, в произведении искусства, потому что э, один, э, один художник – это хорошо. И один инженер – это хорошо, но два – это уже гораздо лучше. И Марк, он является э, хабом своеобразным для всех людей, заинтересованных в создании чего-то э, серьезного и не очень. Хорошо, спасибо большое. Очень приятно было с вами познакомиться. Друзья, Я... может быть, еще у кого-то есть вопросы? Я перехватила микрофон. Yes, somebody else have any questions? And um, yeah, so you saw this sculpture. This sculpture is very interesting. And as you see, the, actually the actual interesting part is um, the shadow also. And um, this can be made very big. So this is something which can be placed in a very, very um, large environment. So it's all good for a a big museum or for a big uh, empty industrial space. And this is actually what we are doing here. We are trying to make things which are very simple, which can work on a very, very, very large scale with lights and computers and sensors, which are interactive. Anyway, yeah, questions. У меня еще вопрос такой, пока <смех> больше не yes. было вопросов других. Марк, скажи, пожалуйста, а вот вы сотрудничаете с какими-то ну, институциями, музейными, или это все исключительно такие партизанские практики в неспециализированных пространствах, ну, захваченных, купленных, там, сквотированных, арендованных и так далее? Можно ли увидеть ваши коллективные работы, инсталляции, вот похожие что-то типа обитаемых скульптур, каких-то реконструкций этих обитаемых скульптур в галерейных, музейных залах? 
Был ли такой опыт? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've done uh, many, many museum shows. I had a show in the Frizzianum, for example, that's maybe the most uh, known one, which is a uh, Documenta GmbH, which invited me. I shown in various uh, Swiss museums, although the Swiss museums are not so happy because, of course, if I come and if I do what I'm actually doing, which is to, to uh, rock the house, they don't really like that because it gets loud and they have to clean up and they have to deal with lots of drunk people. And uh, this they, of course, don't want to do because they are scared that uh, some uh, precious things could get uh, maybe uh, destroyed. And, but I've done it. I've done it a few times, more than once, 50 times. I don't really co cooperate too much with uh, commercial galleries because um, I like to stay out of this field. But I do do uh, museum shows. And if I'm invited to any space which is... Uh, community run or run by uh, <coughs> state, I, get, I, I always come and I do something. Or if it's an independent state. But yeah, I've also done things on art fairs, I must confess, um, but it's not too interesting for me. А как вы находите людей для вот такого масштабного взаимодействия? Вы приглашаете всех как в клуб в эту скульптуру или это знакомые, какие-то проверенные люди, чтобы не было никаких эксцессов? Вообще, или, ну, в общем, как вы собираете этих людей? Well, I get it. I mean, of course, I have a I have a large network of friends, and as I said, this network is based around these events which I was talking about. I forgot to um, talk about one very important event which happens in, in in Germany, and that is the C3. It's the Chaos Communication Congress. Um, it's like a nerd congress. It's like a, a hacker symposium, which is very big. There's like I don't know, fifteen. 15 to 20,000 people who come there who attend this congress who are there for like uh, four days. It's also some kind of inhabited sculpture, I would say, because a lot of the people then live within the congress. So it's really for three, four days and it's non-stop. It's 24 hours. And there's a lot of interesting things happening there. So I have a lot of networks and I, I, I am travel quite a lot. And normally uh, it's 50-50. So I invite a few people and always the other half, or it's sometimes even over the other half, is just people who I randomly meet or people who I meet over other people who I know. So if I go to a space, for example, um, the, the project which I'm doing in Portugal, it's, uh, I have a, um, I'm collaborating with my friend who's called Helena Inverno who's a very important and interesting uh, female uh, documentarist. Uh, she's uh, from, from uh, Beja, from Portugal, from this region, and I know her since 30 years. And um, yeah, so she is my main collaborator there. And my idea is I always try to give, I always think within an artistic project, people should be given the maximum freedom. So the less I say, to this, to that, the better. So the more people realize uh, what they do, the better. And but that's why also I need, of course, always at least one or two people who are experienced in this practice. Because otherwise people just stand around and do nothing. And that's not the idea. But um, I must say, when I do this in habit sculptures, so when I do the events here, and it's like always something between 50 and 100 people who are in this park and they're really everywhere in the park, also in the bedroom and bathroom and everywhere. This normally, I do this once uh, every two weeks. Um, since um, you can see it on the solution, my webpage, which I think has not been hacked yet. So I have a, the solution, which is also on Facebook, which you can join this group. You can see uh, the, some of the events but now during corona we have been not advertising anything because we don't like to have uh, problems with the police but we're still doing things here 
but it's just like happening more on a more clandestine basis. And anyway, there, uh, to these events, if there's 100 people coming, maybe I know 20 or 30 of them. And the rest I've never seen in my life. And um, the interesting thing is that I have actually quite a lot of things here and nothing ever gets damaged, nothing ever gets stolen. Uh, everybody is uh, very nice and respectful because they can see, aha, uh -huh, it's uh, art and um, they have the notion, again, it's something they learned at the Amitage, that they shouldn't touch the art. Марк, а я, может быть, прослушала или вы не сказали. Хочу уточнить, а когда вы начали такие скульптуры делать? Это когда произошло? С чем это связано? Это вот было как раз с практикой освоения кабаре Вольтер пространства или чуть позже? No, no, no. I, I start do this all the time. I've been doing this since. Uh... So in, when I was boarding school, I had a little, uh, I, I even started with this. So I started to collect trash in the street and I made little parties in my, um, in, in my room. And I invite other people. So that's actually, I would say in, uh, I was maybe in 11th grade. And then I started to do this in, uh, in, in squats and uh, many, many squats. And of course the whole, um, event at Escherviz, it was like the prototype of this sort of exhibition, because also, I don't know, many people don't know this, but most of us lived down there in this uh, underpass for three weeks, even longer, even during the build-up. So it was like everything, which can be quite stressy also, as it's 24 hours. You always have people running around. But that's part of the fun. Ну вот да, тоже вот, да, вот вы рассказываете как раз про такое окружение незнакомых людей э, э, постоянно, да, я вот тоже задумалась, а как вы переживаете вот эти границы своего частного какого-то пространства, особенно если вы живете в этом месте, и вот границы произведения искусства, где, собственно, куда допускаются зрители, куда допускается тусовка. I mean, I, I said they, um, until now I've made very, very few uh, negative experiences, but um, I encourage people to, to go as, as, as far as they want. They, I said they can hang out on my bed and some of them do that. Some of them also stay then afterwards and sleep on the sofas. Um, but um, yeah, you try to be as open as possible. That's, that's the, um, that's uh, basically the main, one of the concepts that we have. And it works. Like uh, until now, most of the time people are quite respectful. But it's like, if you let people in, as said, then um, they see that everything is nicely arranged. They are not so much inclined into destroying the things. I think that's it. And the idea is, as I said, to, um, we, what, what I like to do is uh, we like to erase boundaries. So we erase boundaries between uh, nationalities, um, gender, um, ethnicity, and also, of course, uh, at the same time, it's like we also like to erase this uh, perception of, uh, of private space which is also some kind of uh, construction, which we maybe don't need or it's not so beneficial. <clears throat> There's my daughter walking in the background. She's making herself a sandwich. Any more questions? Привет, <laughs> So anyway, yeah, so as, um, maybe if we are ending this lecture now, um, I would like to, as I said, um, 
I said, the, the space and the projects we are doing, we are open for anyone. We are also open for critique and we are also open for new participants. So anybody who is in Prague can contact me or us over Facebook or over Gmail, also over the website. Although I wouldn't do it over the website because it's hacked for the moment, but it will be online hopefully next week. Um, and you are welcome to also see what we are doing in Portugal. And we have, I mean, always the spaces which we're going to have there is very large, so we can accommodate a lot of people. And you're welcome to see and to join us. And yeah, and that's actually all. And also, yeah. А я вот видела, что еще вот Марина поднимала руку. Может, какой-то вопрос еще был? Да. Марина, как вот надо как-то микрофон вам включить, чтобы задать вопрос, если вы хотите что-то спросить или написать в чат этот вопрос, если нет возможности проговорить. Или вы по ошибке подняли руку? Дайте нам знать, пожалуйста. Я хочу сказать, Марк, большое спасибо вам еще раз за эту беседу и за этот рассказ увлекательный. Хочу отметить, что у нас в Екатеринбурге последние, наверное, пару лет, вот у нас здесь куратор Светлана Усольцева, с нами присутствует, она не даст соврать, значит, последние пару лет такая а, инициатива появилась, назыв... круг художников молодых, которые называют себя маргина... маргинальными художниками, то есть не как определение, а как вот ну, такое название, что ли, а, их самоопределение скорее. А, и они а, очень по по с похожими материалами работают, с найденными объектами, с мусором, с каким-то таким трэшем. И делают выставки в заброшенных секретных локациях, в основном из, как раз из материалов, которые там же и находят на этих полу таких помойках. Вот. И э, мне кажется, что э, им ваш опыт и ваши э, проекты э, могли бы пригодиться для того, чтобы как посмотреть на то, куда можно дальше развиваться. Э, я просто упомянула Светлану, потому что она, насколько мне известно, делала небольшое исследование э, и общалась с этими художниками Света. Если ты нас слышишь, знаешь, может быть, ты а, прокомментируешь это. Но, тем не менее, а, так или иначе, в общем, мне кажется... Что... Да, в общем, причем это очень молодые художники, им, наверное, около 20 лет плюс-минус всем. И вот это какая-то новая генерация с абсолютно таким новым партизанским, анархистским подходом к искусству. No, because we have to uh, we have to prepare something. Actually, we are yeah. Because I'm I'm leaving to Zurich tomorrow, and then uh, on the twenty second I'm going to Porto to uh, again drive down with my car around Portugal to look for nice objects where we can make a future center. And you'll definitely hear from me uh, when once we will be setting this place up, which will probably be from spring next year on. Okay. Well, that's Хорошо, спасибо большое, спасибо Мария да, за перевод, и спасибо Марк, и спасибо всем гостям, кто сегодня был с нами. Хорошей поездки и удачи в Лиссабоне, в Португалии. Bye. Bye. I will
Bye. Let's keep it for